Hi, my name is Jeff Cracker, and today on this episode of Cytobytes, we'll be talking about what the difference is between dimensionality reduction and clustering. So briefly, first, what are they? Both dimensionality reduction and clustering are unsupervised machine learning algorithms. Uh, dimensionality reduction places events that are similar in many dimensional space close together in lower dimensional space. And clustering places events that are similar in many dimensional space into the same cluster and meta cluster. And the total number of these are uh, either specified by the user or specified by the algorithm, depending on which one you choose. I like to think of uh, these tools as uh, uh, essentially maps. Uh, a map is a two-dimensional rendering of a three-dimensional object. In this case, we have a globe, three dimensions. There's lots of ways to take that and turn it into something that's a little bit easier to understand, where you can see all of the surface of the globe at one time. However, you make some sacrifices. Uh, most kind of visibly is this kind of split in the Pacific Ocean uh, between Russia and Alaska. And everybody knows they're right next to each other in real life. Uh, many maps show them not next to each other. In fact, almost as far away as you can get. Some maps, however, uh, decide to keep that relationship, but then break other relationships in uh, the three dimensions so you can visualize that in just two dimensions. In this case, Antarctica gets split up into quadrants <laughs> and then put in the corners. Um, but broadly, uh, there's many ways to do this. And that's what our dimensionality reduction and clustering tools are like in cytometry. There are different ways of simplifying many dimensional data into just a smaller, uh, lower number of dimensions. In this particular case, um, we see here a little representation of dimensionality reduction, uh, these different islands uh, of events, single cell data. And this is one way to represent clustering, a minimum spanning tree. We'll get into kind of what the differences are uh, in just a little bit. Uh, but the goal is to basically say, hey, these are tools that describe facets or um, components of your many dimensional data. Uh, but uh, these are just abstractions. They're not actually your data, these tools. Uh, so keep that in mind. There are uh, many ways to kind of show the relationships of your events in many dimensions. And uh, these are a couple of them. So first up, dimensionality reduction. These tools uh, are effective at visualizing all of the events in a data set uh, for analysis and QC. I happen to like them for looking for differences in batch effect, for instance. And the result of a dimensionality reduction calculation are two or sometimes more um, new channels appended onto each of your events in your FCS files that let you plot these kind of derived channels. Uh, the brighter and more distinct the staining is in a particular channel, the more that channel will contribute to the structure of the islands. If it's uh, something like CD4, really bright and distinct, that'll very much uh, pull apart your CD4 positive cells into their own island. Something dimmer or smearier like CCR7 becomes uh, still something you can order by, but maybe not bright enough to separate something out uh, completely into a different island. And dimmer markers, something like CD25, are going to localize events that are you know, bright in that particular marker, but not have that much of an effect on the structure of uh, the resulting uh, islands that get generated. Events that are stained very differently than the majority of the events will be very far away in your dimensionality reduction parameters. Events that are very similar, except for one or two markers, uh, will be right next to um, your, uh, your other cells. And so uh, you, there's no lower limit on the number of events that you can visualize, just on the difference of those events from the rest of the events in the, uh, in the particular calculation. And just a quick note here, dimensional reduction is not creating new populations or clusters, which is why I'm using this kind of island terminology, this cartography terminology, um, because it's not making any new populations. So here's an example of some dimensionality reduction uh, plots. In this case, they happen to be pack map plots. Each of these shows the identical events plotted in the same coordinates, just colored by different things. Uh, this first one are coloring by CD4 expression. You can see this island is bright in CD4. This plot here, we're coloring by CCR7 expression. And you can see there's a gradient here of CCR7 expression, but the marker itself is not bright or distinct enough to break these out into their own separate island. And here we have just this little uh, CD25 positive beach, but not even a peninsula uh, or something, if we're going to really lean into that analogy. Uh, it's just 
um, CD25 uh, in this little corner here on that island. And here, this is something I like to put up when I'm looking at dimensionality reduction uh, results is a density dot plot. So people who are looking at these can see where um, there are many events stacked uh, in this representation versus relatively few. So on the other hand, we have clustering. Clustering algorithms are effective for taking more hands-off approach uh, than manual gating to population separation, especially in like uh, discovery situations. Uh, if you have uh, unknown or non-traditional phenotypes uh, that you're interested in, clustering can be a very, very valuable tool for that. Clustering results in one or more new channels uh, in your FCS files, and also occasionally, depending on the algorithm, some visualizations that come along with uh, those new channels in your FCS files. Um, just a, this is a, a caveat, uh, maybe uh, just something to keep in mind when you're running clustering. The algorithm has to fit events and make hard choices about which events fit in the same clusters. Uh, so if um, you have uh, rare events uh, that just there's not a lot of them there, they might get lumped into a cluster um, that's, you know, biologically speaking, a different phenotype. Um, so you have to keep that in mind and check the results of these algorithms to make sure uh, both clustering and dimensionality reduction that they align with your understanding of the particular uh, situation that you're studying. Uh, but that said, clustering does actually create these kind of discrete new populations, clusters, meta clusters, whatever you'd like to call them. Here's some examples of how to visualize uh, clustering data. We have this classic minimum spanning tree uh, with, in this particular case, these star plots. Uh, the larger dots represent more events. The smaller dots represent fewer events. The colored halos are the different meta clusters these clusters are part of. Um, this is, uh, like I said, a classic way to look at clustering data. Other people will visualize them by plotting every cluster versus every channel that they use to generate those clusters to kind of pull out a phenotype in a heat map. Uh, this is a very efficient way to display the phenotypes, but uh, has a handful of drawbacks. Um, so instead, I personally like to use this special x-axis uh, type plot where we're overlaying a single cluster on top of total events uh, in uh, all of the relevant you know, particular channels that we, we would have used for clustering. Uh, and in this case, you can see that this cluster of interest is CD3 positive, 4 positive, 8 negative, CCR7 positive, 45RA, mostly positive, but it can be beneficial because here you can see there's a little bit of a heterogeneity uh, present. And also you get an idea about the abundance of this particular cluster uh, compared to the total events. So uh, I like this. And then also you can overlay clusters on dimensionality reduction results if you've run both sets of algorithms in your particular workflow. And so this is a... Uh, uh, a figure that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. This is from the OMIP69 paper. Uh, and here you can see a, a whole series of clusters overlaid on top of some UMAP, in this case, dimensionality re reduction uh, channels. Uh, so you get an idea of where each of these clusters lies in relation to all of the other ones on this kind of pre-established UMAP visualization. And this has uh, become a, a common way to look at clustering results in the field. So um, I'm going to wrap up with a little bit of a, a sweet analogy, uh, and that's uh, using Halloween candy. So if you're not familiar uh, with Halloween, uh, that's where uh, kids go door to door in their neighborhood and ask neighbors for candy on a certain night of the year. This is also kind of St. Martin's Day uh, in Europe, a similar, uh, similar aspect. Uh, but basically, once kids go get all the candy from their neighbors, they come home and they dump the bag out into a big random jumble of, of pieces uh, on the table or on the carpet. And then almost invariably, they'll start sorting out um, events, or in this case, candy pieces, uh, uh, into similar little piles. So here we have uh, you know, M&Ms, small and round, next to Skittles, also small and round. Uh, we have the fun size candy bars over here. We have uh, some sort of like puffed rice treat uh, way off to the side. It's very different. So I like to think of this step as the dimensionality reduction. Essentially, you're taking many features, size, ingredients, colors of wrapper, all of that information, and you're arranging those many dimensions into just two dimensions, the x and y axis of your floor, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, kind of arranging similar candies next to each other. And this is actually a photograph of my daughter's floor from Halloween a couple years ago. Uh, she uh, came back, dumped stuff out here, and I walked in and saw it, and I was like, oh my goodness, 
I have to take a picture because I use this analogy all the time. Uh, so I uh, appreciate her contributions to this presentation. So that's the dimensionality reduction uh, component of this. And now clustering would be like if I went up to my daughter and I said, hey, um, I've got these 12 little Ziploc sandwich baggies here. Um, now it's time to put your candy into these sandwich baggies. And you get to decide um, which groups of candy go in which baggie. There's clearly more than 12 different kinds of candy here. And so she's going to have to make some hard choices about what to include uh, in the same uh, Ziploc bag. And whether it's um, normal M&Ms and uh, Reese's Pieces together, one is a little bit more peanut buttery than the other. Uh, you know, those might make sense to put together into the same cluster. But the last cluster, uh, the last Ziploc baggie, she might have to put, you know, this individual box of nerds and this, um, you know, puffed cinnamon sugar treat uh, and maybe the pencil in because that's just what's left over at the end. And so this is, uh, you know, a little bit of a, it's it's a rough analogy, but I I, I tend to think it's helpful for uh, a way to kind of wrap your head around the difference between dimensionality reduction, which is just spreading things out uh, in uh, in space, in grouping similar events or candies next to each other, uh, and then uh, clustering, which is making hard decisions um, potentially about which uh, groups uh, you're going to end up with, um, and then you can information out from those clusters or populations, uh, export stats and things like that. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll wrap up this cytobite. I'd like to thank uh, the ISAC uh, edu uh, Data Analysis Education Task Force uh, and uh, catch you again for the next cytobite.